Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros, kids. This is a special day for us here. Uh, childhood hero is on the show today. A legendary quarterback of the 85 Bears, Mr. Jim McMahon, is on the show today. Jim, thanks for being with us. This is a huge honor. Hey, my pleasure, guys. Good to be with you. Yeah, I'm I'm almost nervous a little bit. Um, because look, you were you were the first football team that I saw as a child, and it just happened to be the most dominant team of all time. And now, you know, nobody's ever topped that team going forward. So I feel like I peaked as a child and we just haven't gotten any better since. Well, I I feel the same way. We didn't do it much after that. I mean, uh uh we did go to the playoffs the next four years, but uh didn't do too well at home in the playoffs, but we had a pretty pretty good football team for that five year stretch. Yeah, and, but it's got to be strange though mm-hmm. being on the great because in my opinion this is the greatest team of all time. I know everybody talks about the undefeated Dolphins team from the seventies, but in my opinion this is the very best team of all time. But then after that, it's like where do you go, um, and how do you get up for that the following years? Well, the the next year, you know, after going fifteen and one. We ended up 14 and two. We weren't that bad. Mm. Yeah. Had the best record. But uh, like I said, we we kept uh, screwing up in the playoffs at home. And uh, it's unfortunate. You know, like you said, we had a, we had a hell of a football team. We, we were the youngest team in the league in 85. So we, we should have, you know, won a couple more. But, uh, you know, losing at home in the playoffs is never a good thing. No, I can't imagine. I mean, you want to win your last <laughs> game of the season, regardless of where it is. But, uh, Man, it, fourteen and one. Or I'm sorry, fourteen. Call, you build advantage, and then you don't take advantage of it. That's that was uh, our biggest flaw. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, you know Dan and I talk about it all the time with the Golden State Warriors. When you're that great, um, and then it's just you're expected to win every single year. Like you were talking mm-hmm. about, like you go fourteen and two the next year, and you're expected to win. And you don't win. It, it's got to be crippling inside, where you're just like, man, we could have had three or four more titles. Well, uh, everybody on that team realizes that, and mm. uh, you know, I, I get a lot of blame for it. But uh, you know, I, I was hurt a lot, which you know, that was most of my career. You know, I, I only played seven seasons in Chicago. I played eight more years, and and I was still getting hurt. But uh, you know, that's just part of the game. And uh, we had we had capable guys behind me, and unfortunately, we just didn't get it done. Yeah, and you know, uh, speaking of part of the game, I, I felt that that team has uh, changed a part of today's game uh, in the fact that um, you guys were the first team that was like really branding yourselves, uh, making a brand out of who the Bears were, mm-hmm. who you were as a person. And I felt that uh, not only media uh, and sports media changed after that, but so did advertising, where it, I mean, it was front and center, and, and, and you guys were everywhere, like you were the guy. Um, did you, did you, were you aware of that at the time? And was that intentional? Well, you know, being paid what the bears were paying me, I needed some outside income. So. <laughs> no kidding. You know, it's I'm, I had very fortunate because I, I did get to do a lot of advertisements and, uh, was able to make a good chunk of change off the field and, right. uh, had, had four little kids at the time. So it was, uh, it was, uh, you know, well, well needed. Yeah, because the, the the NFL salaries weren't what they are now, um, you know. And when you look at guys, yeah, when you look at guys like Dak Prescott turning down thirty five million a year, mm. do you ever look back and be like, man, I would have taken that in two seconds? Well, I I played fifteen years in the NFL. I made a million dollars one one of those years. So, mm. uh, and that was year twelve, I think, in Minnesota. But uh, other than that, it was well below a million. And, uh, yeah, these guys – I went through two strikes so these guys can make what they're making now. Right. And I would just hope that the uh, – you know, you would hope that the league would take care of the older guys by, you know, keeping them on the insurance plan and this and that. But, you know, pretty much once you're out of the league, you're on your own. So – and then the guys are – you know, they develop all these problems, but you know, in their 40s and 50s. And, uh, you know, I'm in my 60s now. So it's – I'm still struggling, but, uh, you know, I'm doing okay financially because I, what I did off the field. 
Yeah, um, and, and you've been one of those guys who have been very, very vocal about uh, the NFL taking care of its players after the game. Um, obviously, it's been well documented that uh, you, you were diagnosed with you know early onset dementia uh, and that you struggle with memory loss and uh, severe headaches mm. and depression <clears throat> and things like that. Um, yeah, we just had uh, Cyril Wecht on the show the other day. He was the Allegheny County uh, uh, coroner for a long time. And one of his employees or one of his colleagues at the time was uh, Bennett Amalo, the guy that, you know, oh, started yeah. discovering all the concussion stuff. So we've been talking about this a lot lately. And, you know, it's a big thing for the veteran folks as well, because we get quite a few concussions, even like uh, rapid succession, mild grade concussions, particularly from explosions and things like that that happen uh, both in training and overseas. And it's not good. No, I mean, it's, um, it's a, a huge problem. And the, the guy that's helping me, Dr. Scott Rosa, um, he's out of New York, but uh, he's also involved in some military uh, studies now and, mm. and uh, hopefully get you guys taken care of as well. How, how bad is it on a day-to-day -day basis for you? Um, and and ex describe what you go through throughout the day. Um, because I, I feel me personally, and, and obviously Dan as well, that the more and more we're able to get these stories out and share them to the world. I mean, we've got 10.3 million listeners on this show. Um, the more that people can become aware of what happens when you get brain injuries and, uh, and, and the help you need afterwards. Because a lot of the time, you know, when you get a concussion or things like that, if your leg is not broken in half, like Joe Theismann on the field, people kind of forget about it. They're like, all right, sweet. It's a concussion. How big a deal is it? Um, describe what you've been going through, uh, you know, since leaving the league. Well, obviously at the time we didn't know, you know, we knew we were going to be beat up physically, you know, shoulders, knees, mm -hmm. stuff like that, but nobody ever mentioned the brain. And, um, you know, they've known for a long time what's, what was going to be happening. And uh, it's just, it's unfortunate. You know, a lot of guys, I, I was in the same position a lot of these guys who've taken their life are. Uh, there was there was times that I'd, I'd have to be in my, a dark room for weeks at a time. Mm. I just couldn't, I didn't, couldn't stay, sit up or stand up because the, the pounding in my head was so bad. And uh, so I, I get, you know, at first I couldn't believe that these guys would actually take their own life. But I, you know, I had the same thoughts for myself because the pain got so bad. And then, uh, you know, the forgetfulness, you know, you walk into a room and then you stand there for 30 minutes for trying to figure out what the hell you're in there for. Uh, yeah, it was, it got unbearable. And thank God that these guys, these doctors in New York contacted me. Uh, I did a sports illustrated cover, I think in 2012 or something like 11, something like that. And they read the story and they contacted me and said, Hey, come to New York. We think we can help you. And, uh, they said, you're going to have to be there a week. So I flew there, stayed there, stayed a week. They sat me down. They said, well, this is what we think is going on, that you have a blockage somewhere in your head or your neck that is causing your spinal fluid to back up into your brain. And uh, they put me into the CAT scan, and that's exactly what they found. Um, I had three different blockages at C1 and 2, uh, C6 and 7. Um, what the hell was the other one? Yeah, I can't even remember that. Mm. But... Uh, <laughs> You know, your atlas bone is supposed to be perpendicular to your spine. Mine was almost straight up and down. Wow. Um, this past, uh, I just went a month ago. It had been about nine months. I usually go every three months because of COVID and everything about flying. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me nine months to get back to see him. And he put me back in the uh, CAT scan. And he said he was glad he did because the uh, the atlas bone, again, was about 30-something degrees off, off uh, where it should have been. So I, he said, you're starting to have headaches. I said, well, I've been having headaches for a while, but mm. you know, couldn't get on a plane. So, uh, yeah, it's very frustrating. I know these guys are proud and, and uh, tough and everything, and, and they don't want to ask for help. But, uh, you know, you got to because when, you're, when your head starts messing with it, you don't, you don't know what to do. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a problem for a lot of whatever you want to call it, alpha type people, mm -hmm. athletes, uh, first responders, military folk. You don't really know how to ask for help or when when it's appropriate to and uh you but you do think about the consequences of asking for help like if you're uh particularly if you're in the nfl now everybody knows about the concussion issue if you start complaining about headaches they're gonna pull you right yeah uh i was watching the the, the game last night and yeah. uh one guy's been sitting out for three games because of a concussion yeah he said he feels fine and wants to play obviously but um you know, the doctors have said otherwise. It's one of those issues where you don't want to say that you have it because 
Uh, you'll be out. Somebody else could take your job. Like the NFL is a ruthless business. Yeah. And, uh, you know, once you're out, you might not get that job back again. Right. Yeah. Out of sight, out of mind very easily, boys. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a while. I don't wild- even know why the concussion lawsuit. It really didn't have anything about do, to do with concussions. Because uh, unless you have ALS, dementia, um, Parkinson's, um, what else? There, there, there was a couple other brain diseases that you have to have mm. in order to get paid. And, uh, you know, I was one of the ma- uh, named plaintiffs in that lawsuit. I was flat out denied. I was I was told I was not impaired enough. And um, you know, I'm not done with them yet. But, uh, you know, I don't want to wait till I actually develop. You know, one of these things, you know, I've, I've already got some issues and uh, they tell me I'm not damaged enough. When am I going to be damaged enough? You know, so yeah. it's crazy. Hopefully they'll uh, this will get taken care of because I, eventually I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get one of these diseases. But mm-hmm. I'd like to enjoy I'd like to enjoy a little something before then. Yeah. yeah. In, in your opinion, um, uh, do you think that the three billion dollar settlement from the NFL was enough? Because it, clearly, if you were one of the main plaintiffs and it didn't help you, it isn't enough. Um, and, and what what more do players have to go through legally? Because, look, a legal process against the NFL is fucking brutal. It's time consuming. And I can't even imagine how much you spent financially. Um, well, that's why they they would rather go to litigation because they know they can outlast us. You know, we can't mm-hmm. keep paying them to, you know, do appeals and this and that. Yeah. And they can, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, that's, that's the league. That's what they do. It is. Yeah. And they just keep chucking people back in and, and whatever happens, happens. Uh, one of the interesting facts that Dan brought up to me right before we came on the show is I did not know you were uh, the backup quarterback on that green Bay team that also mm-hmm. won a Super Bowl. <clears throat> Yeah, was it 95, yeah, 96. 96? Yeah. Yeah. Six, yeah. Uh, and, that, and that was Brett Favre's year, obviously. Um, what was that like, uh, mentoring at, at that point, a, a younger-ish Favre? And did you guys get along during that? Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, he's a heck of a guy, a great athlete, just a tough kid. He just loved to play the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, loved to have fun in the locker room and meetings and so forth. But, um, you know, I didn't have to do a hell of a lot. I don't think I sweated the year and a half I was there. <laughs> Coach Holmgren just kind of, he said, you want to take any reps? And I said, well, am I going to get any in the game? He goes, probably not. And I said, well, I'm not going to take any today then. <laughs> but we, got, we got on great. And, uh, yeah, it was nice to, be, nice to be able to go out my final year and, and uh, get a Super Bowl, another Super Bowl ring. So I got a ring from the two oldest franchises in the league. So. Mm-hmm. It was pretty cool to, to end my career that way. Yeah, they won the first three, right? Green, uh, Green Bay and Chicago won the first three Super Bowls. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty. Uh, Chicago won a bunch of World Championships. They didn't. They the only Super Bowl was '85. Mm, I see. Green Bay. Uh, Green, won. Green Bay did though. I think yeah. Green Bay was the first. Yeah, Green Bay won the first couple. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you know at the time, like, hey, this this dude is destined for superstardom at the beginning of the year? Like, I always wonder how that works out. Um, I, I just coached my my child's team. They're six and under boys uh, champions in soccer. So technically, I'm, I'm a champion as well, Jim. And we're on the same level now. Um, but I had to buy myself my own trophy. But whatever. That's another story. Um, but I didn't know the, this was a team of destiny, obviously. Um, or these were God's children I was coaching. They were just a normal group of kids. When a season starts, in all sincerity, um, do you know, like, all right, shit, this is going to be a great team that could win a Super Bowl? Well, I knew and I knew in '85 with the Bears for sure. Uh, you know, we we had a chance to win in '84. We lost the NFC Championship game that year, and so we knew we were going to be good. Um, you know how the season unfolded. No, nobody probably could have predicted that. But uh, you know, yeah, we we knew we were going to be good. We we felt we should have won that Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the same thing was when I was in Green Bay uh, in '95. We lost the NFC Championship mm-hmm. game. Uh, Coming to 96, I noticed that the Super Bowl was on the same day that we had played it 11 years uh, prior to that. And I said, it's it's actually in New Orleans as well. Uh, I, would, I could have never predicted we're going to play the Patriots again. But uh, I told Brett early on in the season, I said, hey, man, this is all you know unfolding exactly like it did in, in 85. I said, we've got a great defense. 
I said, just don't screw it up. And uh, he didn't. I mean, we ended up 16 and three, I believe, and uh, winning it all. So it was a great way to uh, end it. And it was a lot of fun uh, hanging out with Brett. Yeah, I, it's it's strange that you guys played together because uh, your personalities uh, seem to have meshed really, really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're to me, like when Dan and I talk on our sports show, you guys are in the same vein where you just, you know, young gunslingers uh taking hits but you it seemed like you guys were always having fun on the field you don't see that too often out of quarterbacks today yeah. pat mahomes has kind of changed that yeah but um you know uh the, the rest of the league doesn't seem like they're having a lot of fun nor does tom brady uh, especially <laughs> last night mm, but it seems way. you two guys were always having fun why was it different for you two you think uh i guess because we both love to play i mean we, we just wanted to play we you know, winning was winning was the most important thing to us, and uh, and just being out there on the field, actually being in the, in the locker room with your buddies, that's that's even better. I mean, it's you know, you make some great friendships there, and um, that's that's really what you miss. You know, once you're out of the game, is, is just hanging out with your buddies and just you know, doing the doing the things you used to do. Yeah, that's what it seems like. I, I just I wish more players played like they had fun again, where you don't yeah. typically see it anymore again. And it's fun to watch people that play that way, regardless of their level of talent, really. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Just watching people. Oh, Sorry. There's social media now. They have to, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got to play by the rules. Social media and this yeah, and yeah. that. And, you know, yeah. Like it's it, not about, it's about, you know, how many followers you got because you did something, mm-hmm. you know. But that's, you know, games change quite a bit. It has, yeah. I mean, like I, I look at players like uh, well, the confluence of a great player that clearly very much enjoys playing the game mm-hmm. uh, is not common, I don't think. You see guys like Deion Sanders is one of them. Yeah. He loved playing football. You know what I mean? That's why he's still involved in it now. But when they pop up, like a, like a Jim McMahon or a Dion and yeah. a Brett Favre, uh, you remember them forever. And it feels like, you know, uh, look, I because I, I haven't seen you um, since a, I think a documentary on on Sports Center, but uh, my memories of you are still the, the the guy that is having the most fun on the field and a complete blast and uh, and one of the best. But a lot of these guys, you know, they're more concerned about the branding and social media and everything, like he was talking about, where they retire and you you walk into them in a bar and you're like, oh yeah, you were that you were that guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Jim McMahon lives forever. Like you're, you're the dude forever. Well, I appreciate that. I still. Um... People still recognize me, so it's uh, still a lot of fun. I just played in the uh, the uh, Phoenix Coyotes alumni hockey golf tournament uh, this past three days. So that uh, it's, it's cool to just be around other athletes and uh, different sports, having a good time with them. We got to get you to come out to our next golf thing. We do uh, uh, these events with the Special Operations Transition Fund, basically, is what it's called. And what they do is they take um, – operators from the from navy army wherever and help them transition into executive positions in corporate america and uh we we went to the event this year in in nashville it was tons of veterans were there but also people like kid rock uh john daly so it's a fun time a lot of a lot of celebrities show up and and play give a lot of money to charity to the charity and stuff like that it's fun that's the kind of stuff i like to do i don't really care about golf that much but i do like to drink and uh (laughs) To come down and support that. Yeah. yeah. I do a lot of stuff with the troops. And uh, I was told you earlier, I just finished an, an event with some Navy SEALs mm-hmm. down in San Diego and also back in uh, Virginia. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be around you guys and uh, look forward to coming down to your event. Yeah. What else you got going on with uh, veteran stuff? Uh, I'm actually hosting a tournament here in Phoenix in uh, May. And it's for the Veterans Lodge that they're building down outside of uh, Destin, Florida. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a whole community uh, of just veterans. It's going to be a, a, a world-class TBI center. Uh, mm-hmm. There's going to be a school. There's housing for the for the families. And uh, that's the first one that uh, we're going to have throughout the country. We're, we're going to try to do the next one on the West Coast somewhere, hopefully here in Phoenix, because I want to try to stay out of California as much as I can. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't. I can't figure why though. <laughs> so awesome there right now. 
What do you want to like yeah. see your family and shit? Yeah, man. <laughs> not, I, I pay sixty percent in taxes. Both of us lived in California yeah, at, for that. a stretch, like, and uh, we're all done with California. Jesus Christ, fuck that! I grew up in San Jose, California. So it was a hell of a lot different back in the '60s and early '70s before I left. So it was a nice place to grow up, but I'm glad I'm out. Yeah, same. We're 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 amped to be out of there. I mean, it was cool back in the day. Yeah, look but now. It's come on, great. Man. Yeah, come but thirteen and a half percent state tax. Who doesn't want to pay that? Who doesn't love homeless outside your door every day? And it's going up, boys. It's going up. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it really is going up. Um, I've got a wild one for you, and I want to, I want to, I want to ask you about your memories on the set mm -hmm. of this film. One of my favorite movies of all time is Johnny Be Good with uh, Robert Downey Jr. and uh, Anthony Michael Hall. Wow, that's a crowd. It's uh dude. That was back when uh, Robbie Robert Downey Jr. was Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, he was doing right? blow all the time, and it was, was great. Yeah, he was a blast. Was, uh, <laughs> what was your memory was, of being on that film? It was quite a long shoot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually, uh, I actually, uh, I owed Adidas a uh, commercial, mm -hmm. and so I think they were sponsoring that movie as well. Oh, cool! And so they decided to shoot the commercial during that movie. And so it just, you know, I did my, my commercial part and I just came off and, and hell, I can't remember what we talked about or said, but uh, yeah, it was only a quick, you know, two minute scene, but it was, uh, it was kind of fun. Yeah. I, I, I remember it because again, it's one of my favorite movies of all time, mm -hmm. but uh, you give Johnny this jacket uh, from this, this agent at USC and uh, you're like, Hey man, you, you look like me. You should put this jacket on. And it was decked out head to toe in Adidas and and it was a bit it was a big deal uh, i still have it do you really yeah i still have it it's in the closet that's awesome uh <laughs> yeah it's funny you... <laughs> wait what was that last part it's a good looking jacket yeah oh, it was you, great. It was a great i would wear that every day i know i do it's weird that adidas man has not changed and they've still held up over the years like i still buy adidas yeah, yeah i mean I, i'm wearing adidas were, right now actually you know, I got to yeah. I got to go to Europe oh, on Adidas, and I saw, got to see a lot of Europe, and uh, saw where they made the shoes, and met the uh, you know all the people involved, and uh, had a great trip to Europe on them. So Adidas has always been a good company in my mind. Yeah, but back to what Ross was saying a few minutes ago, you were kind of a trailblazer. I mean, uh, frankly, it was kind of you, Namath, and OJ that became personalities while they were playing. Yeah, in yeah. the NFL, there's there's it's there's been a complaint for a long time, particularly through the late '90s and early 2000s. I guess with social media, it's changed a little bit now, but uh, with players' ability to express themselves individually, because most of the time, and actually all the time when they're in action, you can't see their face, which seems like it's not that big a deal, but in branding, it is because you can see if if you show a picture of Michael Jordan's face just from a profile shot, every human being on earth knows who it is. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's an important thing. If you're trying to brand yourself and market yourself, you guys did it though. You made a music video. Everybody in uniform with the helmets off. That was a big deal to do that. People thought it was yeah. kind of like, oh, they're just uh, a bunch of knuckleheads doing whatever. But that was a big deal. I bet millions of dollars in contracts got signed because of that. Honestly, it seems crazy, but that's probably true. Just the way marketing works. Yeah. What do you remember about the Super Bowl shuffle video? Uh, well, the the idea came to us. And this was the deal. They said, we're going to make a record. Okay. A record. They didn't say anything about a damn video. They said a record. <laughs> and it, the proceeds were going to go to feed the homeless and, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And we're like, okay, cool. We'll do it. And I didn't really, you know, no, I don't think anybody realized what the lyrics were at the time, but you know, once we read them, we're like, dude, it's, it's, it's halfway through the season and we're talking about winning the Super Bowl. I said, we better do it or, you know, we're going to look like idiots. But, yeah. So we ended up, we did the, we did the record part. Everybody went to the studio and we did our voiceovers. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, it was, I remember it was Willie Galt's idea with a friend of his from LA, I guess. And uh, they came to us um, a couple of weeks later and they said, okay, now we have to do a video. And Walter Payton and I both said, no, that wasn't the deal. And they said, no, no, when you make a record now, that's what you do. I said, well, that wasn't the deal. We're not going. And uh, they ended up <clears throat> they ended up uh, filming this thing 
the day after that we lose to Miami on Monday night down in Miami. And so uh, we got back from there about three or four in the morning. Uh, the guys had to be at the studio, I think at eight or nine in the morning. They were there for, I don't know, eight to 10 hours maybe. And um, they did their parts. Um, and then Willie, Willie came to Walt, Walter and I didn't go. We told him we were not doing it. It wasn't part of the deal. And so we didn't show up. And then uh, he came to us a couple of days later and said, if we didn't do our parts, that we they were going to sue us. And so what you see on that video is when pissed off white man had to do his part after practice one day in the racquetball court at Hallis Hall. That's where Walter and I filmed our, our segments. And, and it was after practice and it was, uh, yeah, I wasn't real happy about it. <laughs> but it, people, people still talk about it. They still bring it up. And, um, you know, I guess it's kind of funny now, you know, because it ended up good, but uh, it could have been ugly. Yeah, it's funny, man, because like, you know, when you go back to the 80s, like you remember Ghostbusters, uh, they'll play Ghostbusters, the Super Bowl shuffle, all that stuff. And it was, you know, uh, it was a huge moment in, in American culture at that point. And again, no other team had filmed a video or recorded a song about how great they were. Wait, are you saying that you guys recorded that before you won? Oh, yeah, we recorded it. We were already, uh, well, what, whatever we were after my, I think we were 12 and 0. So mm -hmm. we had another four or five games left. So you recorded the Super Bowl shuffle before you won the Super Bowl. That's, wow. That's, I, uh, there's no way a coach I think would they, allow that. The kids now. these days call that big dick energy, I believe. Yeah. For yeah. Better, now for that, yeah. That we better not screw this up. We look like fools. <laughs> that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all the uh, Super Bowl. Uh, when, like championship t-shirts they print out for both teams and then if you go to like eastern africa right now you'll see a bunch of uh a bunch of uh you know teams that never actually won the super bowl there's a lot of rams super bowl 2019 jerseys and t-shirts oh, yeah. floating around in uh poor countries around I, the world. i'm sure all the children in africa are wearing atlanta <laughs> falcons super bowl champion shirts uh especially after being up 28 mm -hmm. to 3 those were printed and done yeah. and out the door a bit <laughs> I know I was by the way I was at that game and uh it was the worst day of my life I'm a I'm a diehard Falcons fan I'm from, I'm from Atlanta I was at that game that was the worst experience of all time uh do you still watch the Super Bowl and follow the NFL closely at all no um I just check I check in on some friends that are still in the league mm -hmm. um that are coaching now uh Andy Reid a big big one there he's uh I've known Andy since 1977 or 78. He was at BYU with me. Uh, Ron Rivera is still coaching. Check in on him. Uh, Leslie Frazier, I think, is still in Buffalo. Yep. Might be a couple other guys that are still coaching. But I just check scores and uh, like everybody else, I just don't. I'm not a big. I don't watch the games for sure. Mm. Yeah. I, so I, the, that was fun to play. Not fun to watch it. Yeah, the, the, the reason I ask is we've had a handful of NFL players who've been on the show where they said, hey, once I retired, I don't watch football anymore. And, and it's surprising yeah. to hear. Um, why is it for you? Uh, I like to play it. I, yeah. lo I love the game, but just to, you know, especially when I was injured, I hated being on the sidelines, uh, you know, being that close to it, not being able to get out there. Uh, so, yeah, once, once I played 15 years, so I was, you know, I, I'd had enough. Uh, I promised my daughter when she she got to high school that I'd quit and would just stay in Chicago for the rest of the time so they could all graduate from one school. You know, they had to travel everywhere I went for the eight years. They went they went as well for the first, you know, from September to December. That's where they were. And then they'd go home to uh, to, to Chicago. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I retired at 37. I felt I could have played a couple more years. But, uh, you know, I'd had enough. I got two rings. And I said, you know what? Let's do something else. Yeah. Yeah. When you look back on it, can you pinpoint like certain hits that think that, that uh, you, it caused the memory loss and things like that? Uh, the biggest one was the Charlie Martin uh, hit. You know, he came from behind after the play was over and picked me up and dumped me on my head. And that the doc told me the only way that my C1 and 2 could get twisted that the way they are is if I could get dumped on my head. And I, I said, well, I could show you the film. You know, they still show it on ESPN every mm -hmm. once in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that one. I remember the uh, the hit in uh, I took in New York when I was playing for the Vikings. Um, my legs went numb. So I think that's the, the 
when I broke my neck because I, di I didn't realize I had a broken neck until probably about 10 years ago when I was going through workman's comp and they, they did all the x-rays and they asked me, when did I break my neck? And I said, well, I got a pretty good idea, but nobody ever told me. And I played three more years after that. So I'm pretty lucky to be just be walking around. Yeah, that hit by Charles Martin in 86 is probably the biggest piece of shit move an NFL guy has ever made. Yeah, a lot of people say that's the dirtiest play in the history of the I NFL. I think it is, yeah. Particularly because... <laughs> yeah, being the top three, I would think. Yeah, I mean, it's may maybe something Sue has done, stomping on people's heads and shit like that, but even oh, that's yeah. not as bad as picking a dude up. Like, you, you were, what, 15, 20 yards away from any kind of action that was going on. You're in the backfield. Yeah, He's play, chasing play you down. Are, I, I just kind of stepped up and I threw the ball mm -hmm. and it was actually a shitty throw. I got picked and the guy was touched right away. The play was over. Right. And I was just kind of, just kind of let up and I started walking off the field. And the next thing I know, I was, I was laying on the ground. I'm like, what the hell was that? Yeah. Yeah, and, that was a bad uh, one. Yeah. So after that is when I went, you know, at least they, they figured out my shoulder was, was really bad after that mm -hmm. because I, I had some time off. I went out to see uh, Frank Job in L.A. And within five minutes, he says, your, your arm's coming out of the socket. And I said, I know. I've been telling these guys that for 10 weeks, but they didn't believe it. So at least I figured out my shoulder was gone as well as my head at that, that point. You're like a gingerbread man. I mean, they, they, they're really putting you back together here with icing at this point. Um, it's, <laughs> it's crazy you didn't get any workman's comp well, it's or not, anything out of the It's NFL. not icing, though. It's probably, what, what are you using for treatment? I know you use uh, cannabis and shit like that, but are you using anything else? Because I've heard... I've been part of a couple of studies uh, using for for uh, for traumatic brain injury for things like are uh, using things like uh, uh, psilocybin mushrooms, MDMA, uh, uh, ketamines, things like that. But have you experimented with any of that stuff, or is it just what, what, what do you what do you got going on? Well, I usually cannabis is my main form of of uh, controlling anything that's going on with me right now. Um, I don't uh, haven't taken a pain pill I think since 2000. Um, yeah, I was I was still taking you know 30, 40 a month after I retired. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's just to get through the day. Mm -hmm. And then I, I moved here to Arizona 11 years ago and got my medical card. And uh, I've been strictly strictly cannabis since then. You know, I I do the gummies, mm -hmm. the, you know, chocolates, the the uh, the roll-ons, I mean, whatever, mm. whatever product they have, <laughs> I use them. Good. I mean, we have we have a system in our bodies for this plant. We're supposed to be using yeah. this plant. Yeah, there's a lot of and, naturally occurring cannabinoids in your bloodstream. But yeah, Dan yeah. uses it every day. Yeah, I, I use it for a lot of reasons. Mostly boredom, to be honest. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It's mostly boredom. Look, guys. Uh, yeah, but I have a lot of friends who have been on uh, who have used. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of friends who have used opiates for long-term pain management, and a lot of them over the last year or two have been switched to ketamine actually instead uh, like a, a much look cause it's not chemically dependent. Yeah. Uh, CBD. Yeah. Uh, well, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, opiates are the devil. I mean, honestly, that's the worst drug in, on, in, on earth, frankly. Yeah. That and alcohol. Oh yeah. True. Do you drink it all? Uh, I drink quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, you Usually when I'm playing golf is when I like. You just play. asked Jim McMahon if he drinks. I know. I, guess, I, I saw the oh, uh, the Yeti you were pulling up there, yeah. and I was like, that a boy. He's yeah, having a couple. Only, yeah, like I said, I just got done with three days with the hockey guys. We oh, yeah. We we got to get you on the uh, golf course with uh, – with, uh, 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 John Daly. Name? Yeah, with John Daly. Oh, yeah. I've played with John. He's – uh, I played, stayed at his house during his tournament. When oh, yeah. I was kind of – Quite fun with all those Arizona Razorbacks uh, golf carts he has all over the fucking place. You see, it? he po he posted one on social media the other day. It looks like a Cadillac. Yeah, like it's. I'm like, dude, you really buy he's 75 got a lot of these things? What'd you say? He's got toys. Oh yeah, he's got plenty of toys. Uh, tons, man. Well, he also owns a golf course, so that's a write off for him is those golf carts, uh, which is amazing. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you and I have in common, uh, Jim, besides being just you know hugely famous and uh, powerful probably two huge penises as well yeah big penises um, yeah you were a punter at BYU for your freshman season I, I i was a punter in high school i had to be a the punter and the kicker for our teams we didn't have one um how good were you at punting uh well we didn't have to punt much which was nice but uh i could i, I wasn't that great a punter but 
you know, I kicked good enough to, to make the varsity squad. That's, that's all I wanted to do was to, to make the team at the time. We had a senior quarterback who was an All-American. Uh, Mark Wilson was only going to be a sophomore at the time. Um, and then my son, I was actually the third team quarterback. And then uh, our starter got hurt in the fourth game of the year, I believe it was. And then uh, I became the backup. But at, at BYU, even the backup doesn't get any reps. So I, I still was I was still kicking. Uh, but the, uh, my sophomore year, I was I started out as the punter, but I, I ended up uh, being the quarterback halfway through the season. And then uh, they they took the punting duties away once I became a starter. So it was fun to do. But like I said, we didn't have to kick it a hell of a lot. <laughs> what is it with quarterbacks at BYU? I, I've never been able to figure it out. Like a guy like you who rages, right? I'm assuming you're not Mormon. Um, what? Why did everybody go to BYU, and why was it a quarterback factory? Well, the system number one, uh, you've got to you got to play in a good system to have any kind of statistics at all. And that system is still the best one that I played for. Even the seven mm -hmm. NFL teams, uh, they couldn't match the offense that we had. Maybe not the um, offense, but the defense of that 85 Bears. Come on. You're never going to get oh, yeah. the greatest of all time. Yeah. I mean, they had like, I think they had 10 between the linebackers and edge rushers. They had 10 interceptions that year. Yeah. So from, from, the, <laughs> from the fucking seven guys in the box. Yeah, they had yeah, 10 yeah. interceptions. That's incredible. Yeah, but it was, um, yeah, that's, that's the reason they go because of the system. Mm -hmm. I went because my dad wouldn't let me go to Vegas. <laughs> really? Do you want to go to UNLV? I, well, I wanted to, all I wanted to do was to play baseball. That was my first love. I still, I still love playing baseball. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I haven't played in a hell of a long time. Haven't even done one of these fantasy camps lately. But that, that was the reason I was, was going to college. Uh, I got drafted out of high school to play baseball. But my dad said, you're going to college. So I said, all right, I don't want to play both sports. So all the schools that I went to, I went back to Nebraska, Oklahoma State, um, went to Boise State because I'd never been to Idaho. Um, all the Utah schools, obviously, because I, I transferred my junior year in high school to Utah. So I played my last two years of high school ball in Utah, which was quite a culture shock. Yeah. But uh, From Southern California? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, so the only two <laughs> schools that said I could play both sports was Vegas and BYU. And I came, and Vegas was my last recruiting trip. And I said, Pops, I came home and said, Pops, I'm going to Vegas. I had a great time. I said, he said, no, you're not. It's, it's not a big enough school. And I think he was worried about me going on to the next level. And right. I said, hey, I'm not worried about that. I said, I'm worried about having some fun in college and making some money. I said, they just offered me a house, car, money, easy job at the casino. I mean, hell, I could have been, you know, I would have been probably a millionaire before I left school. But uh, Pop said no. And that's how I ended up at BYU. So I did get to play baseball my freshman year. Uh, I played about 10 games. But they, I couldn't get out of spring football practice. So mm -hmm. I, I play a game of a double header, and I was playing in the outfield and throwing the ball from the outfield and throwing the ball from the pocket. So it held a lot different. So right. uh, I was starting to have arm problems then. So mm -hmm. I had to I had to make a decision. And since football was my scholarship, uh, I played my last baseball game then. So wow, that's how I ended up there. That's crazy, man. Uh, looking back at it, uh, who do you think the best BYU quarterback was of all time? I mean, obviously Steve Young went there. Um, yourself, uh, man, and, and multiple Heisman winners there. Ty Detmer played, I think, four four years there. So he's he's got some unbelievable statistics. Mm. Uh, but like I said, it's all about you know the, the system and the and the team around you. And um, you know, I was I was lucky enough to be the first QB to win a bowl game for him. Uh, we won we won two bowl games when I was there. Uh, so it was nice nice to be able to do that. Uh, but yeah, we all had our we all had our moments. So yeah, I'm not gonna. I was the best, even though I, you know, in my opinion, <laughs> and if you talk to my dad, yeah, for sure. But uh, <laughs> well, you no, probably we all, the, you probably made the best music video of anybody that's ever attended BYU. Yeah, so at least you have that. They're not really known for music. No, no, I don't think not. it's allowed there. Actually, is it? Tabernacle Choir, Donnie and Marie. They got a lot of music. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess that's true. <laughs> Who doesn't love Donnie and Marie? They're still in Vegas well, pretending to be brother and sister and not lovers. Yeah, well, Donnie and Marie love Donnie and Marie. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, 
Every time I drive by them, that billboard in Vegas, because like, we go to Dan and I go to Vegas a it's lot. It's like, come on, man. Yeah, it's like, dude, you guys have been fucking for how many years at this point? Like, I don't care, but just tell people, like, hey, we're Donnie and Marie. We're like, brother and sister. It's like somebody with a bad spray tan. Like, you're not fooling anybody. Yeah. <laughs> we all know what's going on here. Come on. <laughs> Do you know them? Yeah, actually, Donnie, uh, Donnie's brother Jay came out for spring football practice one year. Oh, no kidding. And yeah. did, did Jay I tell you Jay anything? I think Jay actually uh, played some Jay, some junior varsity football for us for a couple games, but if my memory is correct. But I just I remember they came out, and I think Donnie was wearing purple socks, <laughs> and uh, our defense couldn't wait to hit him. <laughs> yeah, I think they enjoyed the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what I, I did, they started oh, the uh, Children's Miracle Network telethon way yep. back in way back in the day mm -hmm. and uh actually i did their telethon uh for them one year and uh one of their board members was actually a member at augusta national and so uh i got to play that because i did that telethon so I got, i've been to augusta three times now because of that so it's been a it was a good time yeah and i think donnie and uh marie are still having a good time um you didn't answer the question <laughs> did jay tell you did jay tell you afterwards of like hey, no, I, I don't I know no family secrets there. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Because <laughs> you realize like if you knew that secret and that drop today, like that would be the greatest thing of all time of like, hey, not only was he <laughs> on the best Super Bowl team ever, but uh, he also let it be known that Donnie and Marie were definitely fucking. I want to make that clear. I, I did not let that be known. That was not my <laughs> idea. <laughs> I did not confirm. <laughs> uh, it has always been my, my suspicion whenever I go to Vegas. Um, yeah, I, I always laugh as I pass that sign. And I, whoever's with me, no matter, I, even my parents, I think I told my parents one time we were in a cab and I just go, they were looking up there. My dad was like, ah, Jesus, Donnie Marie are still playing? I was like, well, they're still fucking. So yeah, they got to make some money. Um, but I don't uh, think they're uh, hurting for money. I, you, you wonder, you know, when you see them for like, what, 30 years in Vegas, you're like, dude, how long can you That's do that? That's the only life they know. What <laughs> else would they do? Like, they've got to be worth a couple, like at least 15, 20 million each, you would think. Right? I don't know. Walk away, spend more time with their real families. Like, who knows? You know? Like, <laughs> well, they're, they're Mormons, so they have big families. So exactly. maybe that's why they're still working because they have 75 grandchildren. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? It's just hard to picture Jim McMahon hanging out like at, at BYU with all the Mormons. Like, you know, well, they, they uh, not did. that there's anything wrong with being a Mormon. No, but it's just a different crowd. But, yeah. 30 years to graduate. So I don't tell <laughs> how, how much class I went to. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did. I, I enjoyed during the week I, or I enjoyed practice. I enjoyed playing on Friday night or Saturday whenever I got to play. But other than that, it was not what I, you know, what college, what most people's college life was like. Right. Uh, well, Park City's not too far away. I think, yeah. Well, Park City. I mean, Roy, where I mm -hmm. played my last two years of high school ball, was only an hour and a half away. So that's where I spent most of my time. My older brother and, and a good friend of mine, who's still a good friend of mine, <clears throat> went to Weber State right there in Ogden. So mm -hmm. that's where I spent my weekends anyway. It's right good, after the game, my car back. Yeah, it's a good place to the, good place to shoot guns. Yeah, well, how was your relationship with Mike Ditka, by the way? We got a picture, autographed picture of him on our sets, uh, flipping off uh, a photographer, which was nice of him to sign for us. Um, how well, was he? Was actually, he was flipping me off in that picture. Think, <laughs> that's probably true. <laughs> Are you guys? Were, were you guys close? Do you still chat? Yeah, I see him every once in a while. Um, different functions. If if I'm in Chicago, I usually would would eat at his restaurant, but mm. uh, that that unfortunately closed this year due to yeah. all this crazy. Um, yeah, I think we had a <clears throat> interesting relationship to say the least. Uh, he was, uh, I thought he did a great job when he first became head coach. He got rid of guys that were just kind of hanging around collecting checks. Uh, he got guys in there who wanted to work and we definitely worked. I mean, we worked our ass off. We didn't have any, uh, you know, buddy, buddy sessions, you know, whether it was offensive period or defensive period, everything was live. And, um, uh, he said, this is the only way to learn how to play is by hitting people, getting hit. And, and so we did that to each other for the seven years I was there. And um, I think it just wore us down. I think that was a big reason why we lost in the playoffs a lot. because We were tired, not only of beating the hell out of each other every day for three days, and then you play a game on Sunday. But, you know, after practice, he's running us to death. 
I mean, it was just crazy. But uh, I always told him, I tell him to this day, I would love to play with the guy. He was a great football player, hell of a tight end. And uh, I think if he had, he'd had ever been in my huddle, he would have had a different view of me because mm. he had understood that I actually knew what the hell I was doing. Uh, he thought a lot of times I did things just to piss him off. And uh, I said, Mike, you know, I'm trying to win games here. And, and some of the stuff you send in ain't going to work mm. or ain't going to get it done. And uh, sometimes it would work. Sometimes it wouldn't. But I would, you know, if I changed the plate and it didn't work, I say, look, I screwed up. You know? But I thought I, you know, I thought I could make a play. And that's how I was taught in college. Uh, if you can exploit something on the defense to do it. And so that's that's how I always played. Man, that's cool. Yeah, because uh, I, I always wondered, you know, if, if, if you guys hung out uh, in real life off the field again, it, it, it's the greatest team of all time. So you would expect you guys are always lumped in together. You, uh, you know, Refrigerator Perry, uh, obviously Walter Payton and those guys. Uh, and you wonder if you're, you're friends in real life. Because, you know, like in Hollywood, for example, like there's, there's movies that I've done. I just didn't get along with the people off screen and everybody was so shocked. They're like, I don't understand. You didn't like hanging out. And I was like, no, I hated them. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people i mean not a lot of people but you know most of the guys that uh, you play with i think you you get along with I, I i know i did like i said i played for seven different teams and i i don't remember having problems with maybe two guys out of those seven teams and i never i, di I didn't have a problem they might have had a problem with me mm -hmm. but you know uh yeah you just, you're there to to do a job and your job is to win ball games mm -hmm. and, uh, that's all I was, that's all I cared about. I didn't care about what the media thought. I didn't care what the, you know, sometimes the coaches thought. And that's why, uh, I think a lot of my offensive linemen, when I got in the huddle, they, they listened to what I said, not you know, what, what, what the guys were saying as they were coming into the huddle with a play or anything like that. I said, this is what we're running. And then, and they all understood that I knew what I was doing. And, and so they always had my back. So it was great doing that. Yeah. The, by the way, that statement you just made is the same one that Donnie uh, Osmond says yeah. to the crew before he goes on stage in Vegas uh, with Marie. So, yeah. um, you know, we're going to do <laughs> we're going to play hard tonight. We're going to keep it uh, fresh and uh, keep, <laughs> keep it together when we go out there on stage and try to figure it out. Um, <laughs> you know, Utah's going to pissed at me now <laughs> he's gonna get a call from donny osmond he's gonna get a later. call from donny osmond i can't wait uh just <laughs> tell him tell him we can play in the in the charity golf game together yeah and uh and figure some some things out he can help me with my short game um uh, <laughs> let me ask you do you do you watch a guy like uh joe burrow like the new kids that are coming into the game uh joe burrow was obviously in an electric talent this year for the nfl do you watch him get buried by a shitty offensive line um, and do you say, man, demand a trade and go to a different team like an Eli Manning or something like that? Well, that's that's the problem with being a number one pick. You're going to go somewhere where they they're probably not very good, right? And uh, <clears throat> doesn't doesn't matter who you are as a quarterback if, if you don't got five guys up front. I, I never cared who my receivers, running backs. I wanted I wanted five guys I could trust up mm -hmm. front. And when you got that, I mean, you can do pretty much whatever you want. Is that you know there's there's very little difference between talent wise between receivers, running backs, tight ends in this league. Uh, but it's, it's the QBs got to get it done, but they right. can't get it done. Five guys. Well, particularly running back. How many times has a running back got a big contract and that's worked out? None. I don't I mean, think it's ever worked. Look, he, he had the advantage of playing with Walter Payton, and that's, yeah. a, that's a different story. I mean, yeah. it was the best of all time. But yeah. uh, in today's game, like, yeah, you're right. Uh, the running backs are kind of the same. You can draft those later on. Yeah, but even if you do have a guy that's 24 or 25 and you think this person is a truly generational talent, yeah, even when they pay them, it still doesn't work out most of the time. Like, people thought that about Zeke. Yeah. He was the best running back in the league, maybe other than Christian McCaffrey and, and – He's not. No. And look, you know, like, like the at, difference between the best and the second best or the the middle of the pack isn't like I think that's what you're saying. The difference between the absolute best running back, unless it's somebody like Barry San or Walter Page, somebody Emmett Smith, one of these guys, the difference between great and pretty good isn't big enough to spend fifteen, twenty million dollars a year on this guy. It's just not. Yeah, I agree. Changed. You what? know, the, all the systems now, everything they're throwing the ball all over the field. Yeah. So the running back is not uh it's not a big priority anymore, no. but it's, it should be because if you can't run the ball when you need to, you're, you're in big trouble.
Yeah, and no, I, I agree. But you know, when you see a draft like the one that's coming up in 2021, it, it appears as if three out of the first 10 picks will probably be, be quarterbacks. Uh, number one is is obviously going to be the Jets and Trevor Lawrence. Would you tell Trevor with a year left, like, hey, man, just stay in college because you don't get your leg broken half because you have no offensive line at, for the New York Jets? <laughs> Well, I, 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 he does have another year of eligibility. I didn't mm. know that. He does, yeah. Yeah, he's a junior. Yeah, he's a, he's from the little bit that I've seen of, of him, he looks pretty damn good. Mm. So he might he might come out and take the money, but again, it's going to depend on where you go. Yeah. And uh, you know, I t- I tell him wait till after the draft to to, to, to clear himself, mm. see who's going to get the first pick. Yeah. Can I mean, you I, do that? Yeah, I, I, that was a question actually by one of our <laughs> listeners. Declare right before, but by then he'd know who the first pick is. Yeah, man. Yeah, he'll, you he can, can. You'll definitely be able to know. decide not to. But I mean, it's going to be the Jets. Right? Yeah, it's going to be the Jets. Yeah, they're they're going to go defeated they're, this they, year. They they are intentionally losing games now. It seems. So, yeah, zero and sixteen. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like if I'm Lawrence, particularly after because we at the when when Je, Joe Burrow got drafted last year. On this show, we said he's going to get murdered. Dan actually said week six. I think it was, I thought it was going to be by week six, to be honest. Uh, but he lasted a little bit longer than that, yeah. thankfully. But he Four did games. get knocked out eventually. It's a it's a David Carr situation mm-hmm. from back in the day with the Texans. I mean, you put a a guy like that that wants to stay in the pocket and throw the ball with shitty offensive linemen, and you're going to get, get crushed. And if you're Trevor Lawrence, you feel like – if I'm him, I feel like I'm probably a generational talent. He's got the body for it and the brain for it. He can read defenses. He's very athletic, uh, very smart guy, a lot of good pedigree. And I've got a I – mean, as a player, you want to win games for sure, but you also have to maximize your time on the field mm-hmm. at some point. You know, if you want to – if you want to <laughs> make money doing this stuff, you got to do that. I, I just don't see how you do it with the Jets. Either way, like the Jets are going to – if you're the first pick in the draft, your your signing bonus should should set you up for life the way that it's going now. But yeah, maybe, maybe I agree with you. It's it's going to be tough wherever those first rounders go. It is, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's going to be really difficult because geez, Trevor Lawrence is going to get killed, and uh, you know I, they need everything on that team because I I believe you played with Frank Gore, right? And he's still playing. <laughs> Probably was Frank Gore still in the league when you were playing the running back? I'm I'm kidding. That guy's like 84 when- years old. <laughs> Well, my last year was 96, so I don't know when he started. No, not that long ago. Sure. Uh, he hasn't yeah, been in the league for 24 years. He's Come been on. in for what? He's 37 years old He's 37, now. yeah. He's been in the league since uh, 2005. Yeah, they're, they're, the Jets starting running back is 37 years old, which for a running back is an eternity at that point. That's a testament to that guy and his work ethic. Yeah, he's a stud. Yeah. Adrian, yeah. Adrian Peterson's the same. Taking a lot of hits being a running back. That's a tough position. Yeah. Do you, you know, remember Emmett Smith in, uh, I think it was the 93 Super Bowl, his shoulder was dislocated mm-hmm. and he still ran the ball. Yeah. And that was interesting to me. Look, you don't stop, dude. If you're going to win a Super Bowl, you're going all out, right? He's a tough dude. It's amazing what that xylocaine and all that other <laughs> stuff they shoot. No kidding. Ah, uh, yeah. It's incredible. Dang I mean, it. Man goes away for an hour or two. You can, get, okay. you can get the game. So that was real, right? They were just shooting you guys up in the locker room and, and saying, hey, let's get back at it. Like, we can win this. I had a broken throwing hand in 80, 84 before I tore my kidney up. And so they shot my hand for six games in a row. Oof. Uh, my, yeah, my throwing hand. So, and then people kept asking, why can't you throw a spiral? I go, shit, I can't feel the ball. Wow. I mean, they'd hit a nerve. I usually be numb to my elbow, so the ball was kind of. It still get there. It was just ugly. Uh, how many how many picks you throw in that in that? That span? I don't know how many. But uh, yeah, that's that's no fun. I I got shot in my shoulder because they kept telling me there was nothing wrong with my shoulder. Mm. And I had no labrum. I mean, it was just popping in and out all the time. Um, yeah, I, I was shot with all kinds of stuff, and I was I was eating so many painkillers and muscle relaxers just to play. I don't I don't remember a hell of a lot of my. Of my career man uh it sounds like dan on this podcast yeah it's my day-to-day life yeah dan doesn't remember i mean we've done almost 800 900 shows yeah. on this one dan probably remembers about 20 or the 30 the problem with me is that it's not just physical pain yeah it's the mental 
It's the it's the memories you can't forget. Yeah, and that's the problem with uh, Donnie and uh, Marie Osmond too. It's what you can't tell you. <laughs> You knew, you knew I had to bring it back. I had to, I had to circle back on that. Uh, Jim, now's the point in the show we get to the drinking bro of the week, which is uh, someone who's inspired you or helped you become the man you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? Oh, boy. Anybody well, in Vegas? Dr- my dad. Yeah, my dad just, my dad was my coach. My dad taught me how to, you know, taught me all the fundamentals of, of the sports and, mm-hmm said if you're fundamentally sound you can play anything mm-hmm. but if you're fundamentally sound and you've got talent you can go a long way so i uh always remember that and he's still my biggest fan so he's the one who's uh directing me to where i am that's awesome but i'll have a drink for him because he doesn't drink much well yeah well uh, i'll have a couple for him too yeah we'll have that. about eight to nine today yeah. for him as well obviously on drinking bros uh, you know, for your dad, obviously. And then I'll throw a couple, I'll save a sup, a couple aside for Donnie Marie, but, mm. um, you know, that's how I'm, that's how I'm going to get down today in your honor. Uh, because to, to me, uh, we don't do this often, but, uh, I, I, you're going to be my drinking bro of the week today. Mm. Cause again, as a child, like there's very few athletes that have a, um, a lasting memory of, uh, uh, of, of who you were and, and what you aspired to be. And like, dude, I wanted to be the coolest guy on the field like Jim McMahon. Like, dude, I, I still wear headbands to this day because of Jim McMahon. So, therefore, you're my drinking bro of the week. You were the one that changed the game for me. Like, I've always, Dan it will attest to this, I always liked the biggest personalities on the field. So, baseball was Ricky Henderson, Jim McMahon for football, Deion Sanders after you. Um, I like big personalities who were also great and could back it up on the field uh, because I, I enjoy watching the game and I enjoy watching people who are passionate about the game. Uh, and you, my man, were, uh, were, were the very first for me as a child. So uh, thank you. Hey, I appreciate that, but didn't I, never wanted to be anybody else but me. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, that's the greatest line of all time. That's what I say to myself every day, you know? Never, never wanted to be anybody else but Ross Patterson today, you know? Uh, so did Donnie and Marie, by the way. Uh, no, but to, to get out of here, um, where can everybody find you? Do you do social you media, do you do charities? Tickets for the show or what? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to we're going to have you come down to the the golf tournament. We're going to hire a Donnie Marie impersonator just to follow you around the whole time and sing songs. Anytime anybody tries to talk to you or or interview you, they're just going to show up out of nowhere and start singing a song like a mariachi band <laughs> at a fucking Mexican restaurant. Can you imagine that shit? As soon as this is over, we're taking you to Vegas. Like as soon as the COVID bullshit's over, we're taking you to oh, Vegas. Yeah. It's going to be the four of us in the front row after just a day full of like day drinking. Yeah, get wrecked. Hard day drinking, the old school pills that you used to take in the late 90s. Black Beauties. Yes. Freebird, man. <laughs> <laughs> Stop screaming out Freebird to Donnie and Marie. Oh, boy. What I wouldn't give for just one night of uh, a Donnie and Marie, the three of us, and then just to go back to their hotel room and see if they, they go into different rooms. You know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> you're welcome for this jim you're welcome for every second of it today <laughs> and thank you for being on the show seriously this yeah, is a, a huge it. joy for us hey i appreciate you being, being on this segment with donnie and marie <laughs> <laughs> For Jim McMahon, Anthony, <laughs> Anthony Holloway, I'm Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone. <laughs>